the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to take this podcast one day to Sirius XM. And I'd like to share a studio with Bully Ray so I can give him a piece of my mind. Maybe not. Then he'll probably fucking bully bomb me through the table and then I won't have any podcast. Erase that. Let's go on to another one. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to be able to pay my electric bill so that I have air conditioning while I record this episode of Off the Script for this Saturday. Dear Lord, I'd like to wake up tomorrow morning with a phone call from Cody Rhodes telling me, JD, you are now lead commentator for All Elite Wrestling on TNT. You did a great job during that Young Bucks and Private Party match at High Intensity 8. Then I will ask, well, Cody, that's all great. And fantastic, but what happens to Alex Marvez? Can I get rid of him? Yes, we'll banish him to the PGA Tour so that he calls Tiger Woods on the 18th hole. Dear Lord, I'd like for Vince McMahon to wake up tomorrow morning and realize that he is not the CEO of WWE. Dear Lord, I'd like for Kevin Dunn to wake up tomorrow morning and realize that he has no toothbrush to brush his teeth. Dear Lord, I'd like to wake up tomorrow morning next to Tony Storm, but we all can't get what we want. Dear Lord, I wish I was as successful as a t-shirt company that's going to fucking TNT with a fucking sellout! (laughs) Oh my goodness, man! I wish, I wish all of these people would go away forever. I really do. How great does it feel to have an alternative in pro wrestling again, man? This is fantastic. They sold out 14,000 seats in two hours for the Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. on a Wednesday night. A Wednesday night? Now, granted, it's two hours. So all the cretins on social media are going to be, well, it wasn't like double or nothing. <laughs> it wasn't like a whole out that sold out in 15 minutes. <laughs> Who cares? A sellout is a sellout. At least AEW doesn't have to give away three for one. At least AEW doesn't have to give away tickets for free just so that you're shown on TV sitting in a in a booth somewhere in a seat just so that they could get you on camera cheering for Roman Reigns. I love it, man. This is fantastic. AEW is coming to TNT on Wednesday. And I couldn't be more happier for them, man. Now, honestly, I had my reservations about it because I thought Running a big venue like that, still relatively unknown. Nobody knows what they're going to do as far as direction. We've heard about the direction that they want to go in. Nobody knows what type of quality we're going to be getting on TNT. We have an idea, but we just don't know until we physically see it. But with Double or Nothing, and then Fighter Fest, and Fight for the Fallen, and I'm sure All Out is going to be amazing. I will be there. I honestly think that a lot of people are already sold by what we've seen with AEW. Now, this is great. I'm I'm, I'm ecstatic that they sold out, you know, 14,000 seats in a 20,000 seat venue. Obviously, with the stage and the setup included, you got to factor into that. But after that, you know, the sky's the limit. It really is. It would have been less than two hours, but being that everybody is more than likely committed to going to Chicago to watch this show, how much do they want to spend? How many destination vacations do they want to take? Et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that stuff comes into play, but man, this t-shirt company is a t-shirt company no more. So please, enough with the excuses, enough of, you know, you wanting AEW to fail. For what reason? 
For what reason? I am hoping at the end of all this, I so wish I was a fly on Vince McMahon's office door this morning. I swear to God. Or yesterday morning, rather, because I'm recording this on Friday for Saturday. I just got the news that they sold out. I wish I was a fly on Vince McMahon's office door in Stamford, Connecticut right now. Just watching and hearing the reaction coming out of him. Oh, oh Vince, well, you know, AEW sold out today in, uh, in Washington, D.C. What's our next plan of attack? Ah, more Alexa Bliss. More Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins. How about we bring back Hulk Hogan to go against Goldberg? I don't know what they're going to do, but Vince McMahon should be worried. And this is going to be an every week thing, folks. You think 14,000 seats on night one. Yes, it's expected. Yes, a big ratings expected. Yes, a ratings drop the next week is going to be expected because everything's going to even out. But if they are going to go out there and legitimately have four shows only and sell all of them out with such demand, it's looking pretty bright for AEW. Because I know they're going to deliver on what we've already seen and they're going to deliver on what they promised to bring us on weekly television, man. I love it. And AEW sold out for their first debut episode on TNT. This is Off The Script, episode 285 for your Saturday. This is part number two. Thank you guys so very much for joining me here today. If you have not done so, please hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. Make sure you guys subscribe, man. We are here every single week. Raw, SmackDown, NXT, where available news and rumors during the week with some off-the-script extras, but right here is the bread and butter of the podcast of the YouTube channel. We have Off The Script, the flagship show here every single weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so make sure you guys subscribe and turn on that notification so you are aware of all the uploads. Follow me on social media, man, at JD from NY206, that's on Twitter, and Instagram. Twitter's a great way to keep up to date on literally everything as well, so make sure you guys are doing that. We are on our way to 30,000 subscribers. I wish I could get verified one of these days, but we'll see what happens in the future, man. But thank you guys so much if you are subscribed and following me on social media. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Make sure you guys do that if you guys want to show some extra appreciation for the hard work that goes into this channel every single week. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Go and check out all the other videos that you might have missed this week, man. There was a lot, and there was a lot to go over, including yesterday. WWE is quietly, finally ending the wild card rule after SummerSlam. And then Cody Rhodes says AEW on TNT will not be appealing to the casual audience. Now, that might be a little ridiculous upon first hearing that, but when you listen to what the man is saying... There is no way you cannot agree with him. So make sure you guys go and check that out. On Wednesday, we did NXT. Fandango danced his way down into Full Sail University. Saved his old partner and Tyler Breeze. They are now a part of the NXT Tag Team Division, which is great. We got Monday Night Raw. Our boy Seth Rollins looks to be missing SummerSlam after Monday night. Probably not, but the beating he took, he should. Make sure you guys go and check that out. And Roman Reigns and the Reggie, the Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo mystery. We'll talk about that today. Roman Reigns in the most ridiculous murder mystery attempt that I've ever seen in the WWE. We'll go over all that today right here on the podcast. It's one of the major stories we're going to go over. Roman Reigns is the mystery attacker who everybody says it is. And what did WWE put on social media to really amp up the cheesiness as far as this goes, I will give you guys my expert opinion on what I want to see and what I don't want to see with Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. Podcast today, of course, you guys know the deal, man. I don't even have to say anything. I'm pretty sure most of you guys listening to me can recite the entire advertisement. Harrys.com slash scripts. I got to use Harry's. I'm feeling that humidity get to me, man, and when I have a full beard, it's terrible. So I call upon Harry's because I love the closeness, I love the smooth shave that it provides, and more importantly, I love the price. 
Join the 10 million who have tried Harry's today and claim your special offer by going to harrys.com slash scripts. Harry's founders were just two regular guys tired of getting ripped off and paying for overpriced gimmicks. Vibrating heads, flex balls, handles that look like props in a cheesy sci-fi movie. These are just some of the tactics that the leading brands have used to overcharge us for years. Harry's makes quality, durable blades at a fair price. Like I said, I love that great price. And folks, it's only $2 per blade. To keep prices that low, they cut out the middleman. They bought a world-class blade factory in Germany that's been making some of the best razors in the world for 99 years. Vince will live to 99 years old, and I will be dead before WWE gets back to being what I expect it to be. But they provide a great quality at factory direct prices. Folks, it's a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they will give you a full refund. What you're going to get, JD, this feels great. This sounds great. What do I got to do, and what am I going to get? Well, harrys.com slash grip is going to give you a razor handle for an easy grip. Choice of colors up to you. The orange, the navy blue, or the evergreen. Five blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade for a close, comfortable shave. Rich lathering shave gel that will leave you smelling great, and it feels fantastic on your face. And a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy on the go. If you're a man or woman of business and you need to travel for work, it's going to keep your razor great and safe, secure, dry, easy on the go. If you're just a regular Joe spending the night over your girl's house and you're going out on a Saturday night and you want to look good, it's just as good for you guys as well. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set by going to harrys.com slash script. Once again, guys, please do so. harrys.com slash script. Show them that I sent you to help support off the script. You know, we joke about the AEW effect. It's a real thing. It's definitely a real thing. The AEW effect is being felt by everybody in the pro wrestling world. Ring of Honor is definitely feeling it. MLW is definitely feeling it. Because MJF is now with All Elite Wrestling. And he was a staple in MLW. Impact, if they're not feeling it yet, they will feel it. They'll feel it when LIX makes their decision on where they want to go next, whether it's NXT or AEW. The likes of Jordan Grace, Tessa Blanchard, all of OVE, Sammy Callahan especially, everybody that is currently employed right now with Impact Wrestling is not going to be there for the duration of their career. And who is Impact Wrestling going to get to fill those major potholes left by AEW. The AEW effect is real. Now, I wasn't big on Defiant Wrestling. I didn't really watch much of Defiant Wrestling. I watched when it was what culture pro wrestling, just to see what was going on. They had all their top personalities there, and they used those personalities to build up the brand with some credibility, and it was a smart thing. They were popular guys over on the what culture side of things. And then then you take them and you put them in a wrestling ring and you make them the centerpiece of the promotion. Whatever roles that they had, I don't remember. It was a smart move. It was a smart move. And then most of the guys went to go do Cultaholic. And then Adam Blompier, he had to deal with some personal issues. And then Defiant was born. It was no longer what culture pro wrestling. Now, it started out by whatculture.com in June 2016. It aired weekly on the YouTube channel. And it initially featured top names from British, you know, uh, the British pro wrestling scene. And it was taped with weekly shows. The size of the group's online audience meant it grew at an incredible rate because most of them were subscribers and interest in the product came from whatculture. Promotion sold out 2,500-seat arenas four months into its birth, featuring the likes of Cody Rhodes versus Kurt Angle in one of the premier main events for What Culture Pro Wrestling. Over the years, the majority of the biggest names in the independent wrestling scene appeared for the promotion with an all-time roster reading like a who's who right now in pro wrestling. However, as the promotion grew and its wrestlers were given a larger global platform to perform on with NXT UK 
and All Elite Wrestling and obviously Impact Wrestling wanted to make sure that they stay afloat, so they needed to take some people and give them a platform. Many of the top stars in the promotion left to go wrestle elsewhere. The promotion lost more talent over a short period of time than it was able to replace, which now uh, obviously caused them to close its doors and the interest in the overall promotion began to dwindle. A rebrand from What Culture Pro Wrestling to Defiant Wrestling was intended to bring back wrestling fans who had dismissed the group as a YouTube promotion and allow the group to stand on its own two feet as a wrestling promotion, but ultimately it had the opposite effect. Many wrestlers who competed for What Culture Pro Wrestling slash Defiant and enhanced their careers by performing there have since taken to Twitter to thank the group for part uh, or being a part of their promotion and shaping their careers. Killian Dane, who wrestled for What Culture Pro Wrestling right at the start of the promotion, was the promotion's first world champion. He expressed his sadness to the group and Bea Priestley and Travis Banks, who now wrestles for NXT UK, also chimed in and thanked What Culture Pro Wrestling slash Defiance as they close their doors this week. It's a sad thing to see, man. A lot of people were invested in that, and they had a dedicated fan base. And I'm not surprised by this, man, and neither should you guys if you're a fan of Defiant Wrestling. It's something that was expected. Everybody is feeling it. Like I mentioned, Ring of Honor, MLW, you got Impact Wrestling feeling it. WWE is feeling it. Because every time WWE has to dip into their wallet and pull out more money to keep a talent or go into their wallet and and take out money and pull out all these types of money to take somebody off the independent scene so that they don't go to AEW, they are feeling it too. WWE is definitely feeling it. They're feeling it in more ways than one, not just their wallet. They're feeling it in the ratings. They're feeling it in in the overall interest of the product. People want an alternative. People want something new. People want something fresh. AEW is going to deliver on all those accounts. WWE is feeling it. WWE is feeling it in their attendance for pay-per-views and live TV shows, house shows. They're feeling it. So this was expected. There's a lot of places that are closing down. Wrestle Circus closed down last week as well. And I don't know what the reason is for that, but that was a pretty successful fucking promotion before AEW opened its doors. This is not something new, folks. The AEW effect is being felt all over. Because now, these major promotions are pulling from these promotions and they're looking at these promotions at who's the next biggest star. The biggest stars on the indies were everybody now running All Elite Wrestling. And now... They're looking to find the next Young Bucks. They're looking to find the next Cody. They're looking to find the next Kenny Omega. Where are you going to go wrestle? You're going to wrestle where you wrestle, and then you're going to be scooped up because they're going to scoop you up so that WWE doesn't get a hold of you. WWE is going to scoop you up and put you in NXT or NXT UK or keep you in the PC just so that you don't go to AEW. I mentioned on Wednesday that Triple H is in Japan. He was in Japan for the last tour scouting with his team just to get the leg up on all elite wrestling because he knows women women's wrestling from that part of the globe is going to be a major focus point on AEW television and Kenny Omega has his hand in that market. He wants to present those women on TNT. He wants that to be a part of their shows. Competition is getting fierce. Defiance and Wrestle Circus and and promotions like that, they didn't stand a fucking chance. They didn't stand the chance. Especially with WWE taking Evolve and making it its own, taking Progress, ICW, making it its own. WWE is closing doors for these promotions to work with anybody else. They want their hands in those promotions because of what AEW is doing. It's ridiculous. Defiant closed its doors. I feel bad for anybody that's losing their job. I feel bad for the fans who who were so invested in this product and now it's no more. But it's something that was to be expected. And AEW, WWE, this is the remnants of war. Everything around it is going to suffer 
And the two soldiers on the battlefield are going to be Jacksonville and Stamford, Connecticut. So I feel bad for everybody, but it's the way of the business, folks. It was to be expected here in the looming war between AEW and WWE. Speaking of war, I'm going to be going to war with my fucking coffee machine on SummerSlam Sunday. Goldberg is now scheduled to have a match at SummerSlam. I was going to say at WrestleMania, at SummerSlam. Because SummerSlam is supposed to be equal or equivalent to WrestleMania like we talked about on Friday. No. I'm sorry. There's only one WrestleMania, folks. SummerSlam doesn't need to be WrestleMania. It was never billed that way anyway. It was always his own entity in the summer. It's the biggest party of the summer. They never mentioned anything about WrestleMania. Now everything's got to be WrestleMania worthy. Seven hours. Kill me. Goldberg, apparently, will return for a match at SummerSlam. I wish I could poll. In fact, I will. I'm going to put a poll out on Twitter, and I'm going to put a poll on the video, just so that you guys can vote. Are you interested in Bill Goldberg coming back for a match at SummerSlam with Dolph Ziggler? Now, here we go again, folks. The Goldberg rumors are swirling again after Super Showdown. He tweeted out that he was disappointed and he would make it up to everybody. Then we heard rumors of Goldberg coming back. Dolph Ziggler mentioning his name. Meltzer then said Goldberg is not scheduled to be at WrestleMania. And then Dolph Ziggler and The Miz were thrown into a graphic on SmackDown Live. And we have that match now scheduled for SummerSlam. Then it was reported by Meltzer that the Miz and Dolph Ziggler match was only a red herring. It was like a smoke signal. Hey, look at that, but don't be concerned with that. We're going in another direction. And now, Goldberg is scheduled to be, and will return, at SummerSlam. Now, it was originally reported that Dolph would be going one-on-one with a legend at the show. People said it was going to be Shawn Michaels. And then it was booked to be The Miz. And The Miz, folks, is not even close to being a legend. Despite all of this back and forth and the rumors and the Brad Shepherds and the Dave Meltzers, Dave Meltzer is adamant that Ziggler versus Goldberg will be taking place. The biggest news has not been announced yet that Goldberg will return to SummerSlam to face Dolph Ziggler. They got one fucking week to do it. Unless Goldberg is on... SmackDown Live, I don't know how they're going to get this match on the show for Sunday. Because why wouldn't you want to advertise Bill Goldberg for SummerSlam if he is indeed going to be on the card? Is he going to show up? Is he going to pull up in a limousine the night of? Is he going to challenge Dolph Ziggler there on the pre-show? Or is Bill Goldberg simply going to be in the arena and we're going to get the Miz and Dolph Ziggler and Goldberg is going to make his way down the aisle and cause Dolph Ziggler to lose, giving Miz the victory? I don't know. Nor do I care. I I don't care. This is not what I find interesting for the biggest party of the summer, folks. This sounds like the biggest letdown of the summer. Now, this match has not been announced yet. Currently, they are advertising Ziggler versus The Miz, which is the match that 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 they've been building up on television. Ziggler vs. The Miz is a red herring by Dave Meltzer. This is what he says. And the idea is that Ziggler will be disrespected Uh, by The Miz, and he's going to show disrespect to Shawn Michaels. He super kicked him. He's disrespecting the legends. The idea that Ziggler would have the locker room against him and that Goldberg, who Ziggler has mentioned in passing on every program since that Miz TV, would come back and be the hero for the legends. You can see the excitement jumping off my face, folks. Who the fuck has Dolph Ziggler really thrown under the bus here? He threw Shawn Michaels under the bus. That was the only legend that he mentioned outside of Bill Goldberg. So you mean to tell me by mentioning Shawn Michaels that Goldberg is going to come to the aid of Shawn Michaels? Who gives a shit? Now, I would not even book it at SummerSlam. I would not. If you really want to make sense of it, have this Miz versus Ziggler match go the distance. Do it at SummerSlam. Give them 10 minutes. Have Ziggler win because Ziggler's a loser. Have him go on this rant about how he is the new legend killer. How he's tired of these legends coming back. He put Shawn Michaels in his place. He shut up the Miz who came to the defense of Shawn Michaels. 
Have him go on this tour of disrespecting legends. And then Goldberg, you could book him in a match with Dolph Ziggler at the next pay-per-view. Or at Survivor Series. Why does it need to be SummerSlam? I don't get it. This is a common theme that we're seeing here. Why SummerSlam? You're going to book something in one week of time for SummerSlam? Goldberg hasn't been on TV since Super Showdown. Why are you going to book this match? And what the fuck does it mean to anybody? Why does anybody care? Why should anybody genuinely care to begin with? If the match doesn't last seven seconds, if this is the case, who gives a shit? The last thing I want to see is Bill Goldberg in a 10-minute fucking match with Dolph Ziggler. Now, according to Meltzer, this is very much a Paul Heyman move. Because Goldberg is reportedly one of the people Heyman was put in charge of booking. Heyman is a big believer in one badass old man who comes back at random times, like John Wayne, or the role of Bruno San Martino. Believe me, folks, Goldberg is no John Wayne. I grew up on John Wayne because my grandpa was a big fan of John Wayne. Now, really, this is the role that The Undertaker's been using. One badass old man who comes back and he digs holes and he takes souls. Why do we need Goldberg to do what The Undertaker has already been doing? And much better, I might add. Who gives a shit about Goldberg? Goldberg's main reason to come back to television was to have his son watch him perform in a wrestling ring, being that he was old enough. Because when it happened the first time around, he wasn't old enough. Now he is. He won the world title. He lost the world title. He had a damn good match in the five minutes that it was with Brock Lesnar. What more do you need from Bill Goldberg? What does this mean to the overall quality of the show to have Bill Goldberg back against Dolph Ziggler? Or is it Bill Goldberg wants to merely come back, wash the bad taste out of everybody's mouth, he doesn't give a fuck who he, who he works with, and that's it. Then he'll go away and ride off into the sunset. Which one is it? I, I don't care. I, I don't even know what to say in regards to this. Now, Matt Riddle, he had a lot to say about this. Matt Riddle, about Goldberg's performance at Super Showdown, got him in trouble. He mentioned something on social media. He put a video out disrespecting Bill Goldberg, saying that Goldberg was the worst wrestler he's ever seen. It got him into trouble. It got him into trouble so much that they booked Killian Dane to destroy him a couple weeks ago on NXT TV. Matt Riddle then goes on Instagram and takes a fan-made poster of Dolph Ziggler and Bill Goldberg, and he said... Make it a triple threat match, bro. It's what the people want. Someone from the WWE offices, one of the higher-ups, I don't know if it was Brad Shepard, I seen it on Twitter, I don't know if it was WrestleVotes or Brad, Tw- or Brad Shepard on Twitter, but they mentioned this, and a direct quote came from the higher-ups in WWE, and I quote, this is how one gets into trouble. Do you want to get into trouble? They said this about Matt Riddle on Twitter. He doesn't learn. Keep your fucking nose out of Goldberg's business. Worry about what you got going on in NXT. Then it makes me wonder, is Matt Riddle really going to get in trouble? Because what the fuck are you going to do? Are you really going to punish Matt Riddle to a point where he doesn't want to go out there and be with the WWE. He's not going to give it his all. What happens when you promote him to Monday Night Raw? He's not going to give a shit. He's not going to give a shit about anything. You continue to give this guy the, you know, the the, the lashing on social media. You continue to make this guy, you know, a scapegoat and someone who can't go out there and give the people what he's thinking to an extent. If you're going to criticize him at every twist and turn, what, what do you think is going to happen? Matt Riddle's going to become unhappy. He's going to go into this lazy. He's not going to give a shit. Then he's going to wait for his contract to be up, and then he's going to go on TNT, and he's going to main event against Kenny Omega. So what are you going to do? You're going to punish him? You're going to suspend him? You're going to dock him pay? You're going to punish him some more on TV? Who's the next to beat up Matt Riddle? It's ridiculous. You can't win in this. 
You know, you could say it's not a good look, but what are they really going to do in a day and age when WWE doesn't want to lose anybody? And no, they're not making it a triple threat match, bro. They're not doing anything with Matt Riddle and Goldberg, bro. I don't even want them to do anything with Ziggler and Goldberg at SummerSlam, bro. It's unlikely that this match is ever going to happen, but Goldberg and Matt Riddle seems to constantly be a thing on social media. Now, I don't know what's going on with this. Like I said, WWE has one week. There's one more SmackDown show before SummerSlam. If they don't do it here, when are they going to do it? Why wouldn't you advertise Bill Goldberg on SmackDown to be at SummerSlam? It seems foolish to have this match happen like that with no advertisement. You haven't really built excitement about it. Nobody's really excited about Dolph Ziggler, yet he's mentioning Goldberg every single week. I don't think people are that smart to kind of piece together what WWE is planting here. I, I think, and I would say, the smart thing to do is get Goldberg on TV and have him come out and confront Dolph Ziggler. Put Dolph Ziggler in his place and then book the match. But why would you do it one week before SummerSlam? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Even though SummerSlam's already a sellout, maybe they want a surprise. What the fuck do I know? I just don't like it per storyline purposes because there's legitimately no build and there's no reason for anyone, whether you're there or watching at home, to care about it. It's a red herring. WWE booked The Miz and Dolph Ziggler at SummerSlams with intentions to change it, says Dave Meltzer. We'll see. We'll see what happens. What I want WWE not to do on top of the Ziggler versus Goldberg match, rumored, is Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan at SummerSlam. I remember back during one of the Elimination Chamber pay-per-views before Roman went on to win the WWE Championship, that Daniel Bryan was put in a position to put Roman Reigns over. I didn't like it. I didn't like it whatsoever. Daniel Bryan, to me, was always the guy that was going to be the man after John Cena. The reaction that he got at WrestleMania was crazy. On the road to WrestleMania was crazy. I still go back and I watch that steel cage match in Providence, Rhode Island, where he took off the Wyatt family, you know, suit. He was in the Wyatt family. He was in a steel cage match with Bray Wyatt. I still go back and watch that and just feel the reaction, man. And my reaction to that reaction is I get chills every single time. It was unbelievable. I've never seen anyone since the days of Austin and The Rock hold... 15,000 people in the palm of their hand, or however many people were in that arena. It was a jam-packed Monday Night Raw, man. They wish they could do that nowadays. He had everybody's hearts and emotions in the palm of his hand. Every yes movement he did, every yes chant he did, people were synchronized, on time, on point with what Daniel Bryan was doing. Unbelievable. He won the WWE Championship. He had relinquished the title because of injury. He tried to come back. Then they put him in a match with Roman Reigns, I believe the following year. And Roman Reigns went on to win the WWE Championship. Now, Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan has been something that a lot of people were talking about when Roman Reigns got moved to SmackDown Live. Roman was the greatest acquisition of SmackDown Live or the greatest acquisition in SmackDown Live history. Uh, I'd love for Brock Lesnar to get on the phone and hear Vince McMahon say that. Roman Reigns was moved to SmackDown, and Daniel Bryan was there, waiting, when the time was right, to feud with Roman Reigns. I envision this to be a WrestleMania match, a possible main event for a world championship. I'd envision that it would be Roman the heel versus Bryan the babyface, because there's money there. There's money there. Roman turning on the fans because they always sided with Daniel Bryan, and you can go back and reference everything that I just mentioned. The Yes Movement. How Daniel Bryan was always the guy in people's eyes, and Roman was never accepted because they always wanted Bryan. It's an easy story to tell. It is so simple that it's one of those things that I would love to see materialize on TV. Roman Reigns had nothing to do with SummerSlam. Putting him in a match against Samoa Joe is, I would say, a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it keeps Roman Reigns out of the WWE Championship and the Universal Championship title pictures, which 
I don't think he, he needs to be in those pictures again, period, ever. Now, on the other hand, we got Samoa Joe, which is something we've seen already. It's something that we've seen already, and I have no interest in it, because there's only one outcome here, folks. This is a one-way ticket. Roman Reigns is going to get the victory over Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe couldn't beat anybody before him. What makes you think he's going to beat Roman Reigns? Joe was great. Joe deserves better, but putting in a match against Roman Reigns is very predictable, and it's not the good type of predictable. And we've seen it already. No matter how good their interactions are, no matter how good their promo work can be back and forth, it doesn't really speak to me as being SummerSlam and something that could honestly be kept off the card. Now, they're not going to keep Roman Reigns off the card, but this is not the way to go about it. I'd much rather see Joe and Reigns just to finish that off and then build towards what WWE potentially has planned here. The Roman Reigns mystery attacker on Tuesday was rumored to be Buddy Murphy. That don't make sense either because I can't see Vince putting Buddy Murphy in a match against Roman Reigns. Nor should he be in a match against Roman Reigns because again, just like Joe, they'll be sitting next to one another on this one-way destination. It's a one-way ticket for Buddy Murphy as well. Loss. Buddy Murphy has not been in a match on live television since the draft or the shakeup. And I think he needs a victory to establish himself. The last thing we need is Buddy Murphy in his first match against Roman Reigns. Nobody will take him seriously. Now, he definitely has a opportunity here to kind of make himself known. He mentioned on that State of the Union that Shane McMahon did. The SmackDown inaugural address, or whatever the fuck they called it. Kevin Owens was mentioning Buddy Murphy. Why isn't Buddy Murphy getting TV time? Buddy Murphy was there in front of Shane McMahon, and he says, I'm going to kick Kevin Owens' ass. I don't need Kevin Owens to vouch for me. I'm going to make my own opportunities. There you go. That's an easy in. That's all I needed him to hear, or to say. That's all I needed to hear. Buddy Murphy's going to make his own opportunities, and this is a great opportunity to make that opportunity by trying to kill Roman Reigns on SmackDown Live. I don't want that to be the case because, like I said, he's on a one-way destination here, folks. Loss. We don't need that to happen to Buddy Murphy. People were then saying it was Daniel Bryan, and I could see that. Career-altering announcement, career-altering announcement, two different times, and we haven't gotten Daniel Bryan to utter anything as far as this career-altering announcement. What is Daniel Bryan going to do? Is he going to retire? Is he going to 205 Live? I've seen some people talking about Daniel Bryan going to 205 Live. I was to mention that a couple weeks ago. Nobody really thought anything of it. Now I'm hearing and seeing people mention where they get it from. It wasn't reported anywhere. I was the one who said it. I wouldn't like that either because that's a death sentence for Daniel Bryan. Is Daniel Bryan going to sit at home? Is Brie pregnant? Are they having another child? Career-altering announcement. That could be the case, and he could be sitting at home, you know, taking care of his family. I don't know. I don't know what it could be. And then we got thinking, what if this career-altering announcement is the fact that he was playing everybody? Career-altering announcement. Career-altering announcement. Nothing's said. Nothing's heard of. So he he goes and does this, tries to kill Roman Reigns, and the career-altering announcement is, actually, I'm the one who tried to kill Roman Reigns on SmackDown Live a couple weeks ago. Now, according to Dave Meltzer in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, it's going to be revealed next week. I don't know how true this is. Again, take this with a grain of salt. I hope this is not the case. According to Dave Meltzer in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, it's going to be revealed next week that it was, in fact, Daniel Bryan who pushed the scaffolding and tried to kill Roman Reigns on SmackDown and not Samoa Joe or Buddy Murphy as it was rumored. This makes sense since Reigns is advertised to take on Bryan following SummerSlam and house shows and on episodes of Raw and SmackDown Live. It would also seem to explain why Brian has been so quiet about this career-altering announcement that he keeps teasing, as the go-home show for SummerSlam would be the best place to announce that. Now, I'm sure we'll get some kind of... Remember Big Cass? Remember who attacked Big Cass? All that shit that happened, and it was grainy footage 
of him in the back and he kind of sabotaged his own attack. I'm sure we'll get some fucking black and white footage, some su- some security cam footage, you know, with Brian hiding behind the scaffolding or like I'll get to in a second, him driving the fucking forklift that WWE now says knocked over the scaffolding and the crates. It was definitely Scooby-Doo-like. And then this will lead to the two having a match at SummerSlam. Now, with a match of this caliber, a match this great, I don't expect WWE to make the logical decision here. I expect them to go and do it like that, put it on SummerSlam, and it gets Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, two of their biggest stars, at SummerSlam in a marquee match. Now... I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. That's not the way I do it. I would actually do it the opposite. I would give my SummerSlam card, Joe and Reigns, have them finish that off, and then go and book Brian and Reigns at the first show on Fox Sports for SmackDown Live. Simple as that. I'd actually keep this thing going. I would actually keep this thing going and have Roman Reigns walking around. It could be anywhere. Make it fun. Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns in this Final Destination-like kind of storyline. Everywhere Roman Reigns goes, he's paranoid. He's wondering what's going to happen next. I think that would be fucking great. Have it be like a Final Destination scenario with Roman Reigns walking around with, instead of death following him, Roman Reigns is trying to kind of avoid whoever this mystery attacker is. You can't build intrigue on a storyline like this and have it end in one week. Everybody's already invested in this. The sheer stupidity and the silliness of this thing have people engaged. They have people interested. So now it's up to WWE to kind of fill in the pieces here and make it even that much more interesting and give us a reason to watch these shows. Now, I hope someone on social media is out there listening to me. I seriously hope. I know it's not going to really matter, but I would not book this match at SummerSlam. They have nothing to do with one another. They've never crossed paths. They haven't mentioned each other at all. And you got, since this coming week, six days before SummerSlam. Why would you go and make a match of this caliber like that, just willy-nilly? out of the blue, and put it on SummerSlam's card without the proper build. Why must WWE give us the match and then get into the storyline? What happened to giving us the storyline and then getting us to care about the fucking match that is inevitably going to happen? They're doing things ass backwards just for the sake of making SummerSlam the way it should be. And it's not, that's not the way you go about it. Now, I did say, if you want to make SummerSlam's card really great, You got to load it up. I didn't expect WWE to make this thing loaded with no fucking storylines. You can't do that. Why am I going to care? You can't do that, man. And why would you want... Here's Here's the fucking cherry on top of the cake. Why would you want Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan in a smart mark town like Toronto? Please ask yourself that question. I can't see WWE thinking this is a good idea. They probably want to get this match on the card because it's Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns. But at the end of the day, it's Toronto and Daniel Bryan is always going to be more loved, more over, whether he's a babyface or a heel, than Roman Reigns. You'd think if you put Roman Reigns in a situation like this on who tried to sabotage and who tried to kill, who tried to take out Roman Reigns, you don't think that this is going to backfire on WWE? It could be anybody in that situation. Anybody in that situation. They're going to be the more over one because they're doing something with Roman Reigns in which a lot of people want Roman Reigns to be taken out. So, it could be Joe, it could be Buddy Murphy. They're going to be over. Because they tried to take out the most unpopular guy on the roster. Someone who's not, in the fans' eyes, the man. Someone who has given them five years of grief. 
You don't think a smart mark, a smart city for Toronto at SummerSlam of all fucking places. Finally, a major pay-per-view in Toronto. You don't think they're going to go in there and back Daniel Bryan in this? Daniel Bryan's going to become a babyface just like that all over again. Does WWE want to risk Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan in the ring where Roman is the most undoubted fucking top heel in the company in that moment when their entire reason is to make him a babyface and Bryan is the heel? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work at SummerSlam. It's not going to work on SmackDown Live. It's not going to work at any pay-per-view that WWE does because Daniel Bryan, no matter if he's heel or babyface, he is loved. He is looked at as the guy. People want Daniel Bryan in a bigger role on SmackDown Live. They never wanted him to be in the tag team division. People are claiming that they want him in the main event again because that's how good he is. That's how good he is. Everything the man does, everything the man says garners attention, especially now that he's a heel because he does it so damn good and I could see everything he says having legit- legitimacy behind him because that's who he is, amped up. Putting Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan in the main event, or or I should say, should be in the main event, but putting that match at SummerSlam, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be a good look for WWE. It's not going to be a good look for Roman Reigns. Now, I, again, let me reiterate this. I would do Joe and Reigns at SummerSlam. Now, it's predictable, it's inevitable, but at least it gets that out of the way. I would rather them do that than give me a half-ass build with some fucking Scooby-Doo mystery machine bullshit behind it in this storyline only to get this match to happen at SummerSlam. I want good storytelling. The entire reason why you got Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman back on these shows is to get the storytelling back on track. Having this match take place at SummerSlam after this bullshit that we've seen on Tuesday reeks of Vince McMahon and desperation just to get Roman on the fucking card. Now, if you were smart, you'd take what happened on Monday and put that at SummerSlam. That I could see as well. But they won't do that. Because to them, they got to make this show 17 hours fucking long and they got to get everybody on the card in individual matches. Meanwhile, there's no story there enough for us to care. At least the eight-man tag would be fun. At least the eight-man tag would be exciting. At least the eight-man tag would take everything that is unimportant on these shows, put them together in one big package, and get it over with. Then you could revisit the Daniel Bryan, Roman Reigns mystery attack on Tuesday night. Give people a reason to watch. If you give people a reason to watch, this match will mean more to you in the end. If you're blowing it off on SummerSlam, then after that first match, no one's going to care. No one's going to care. And then people are going to complain, oh, 50-50 booking. Who's going to come out on top? Why are they feuding? Where does it go? What does the winner get? Why? Why? Where is the end destination for this thing? See, Aleister Black had this thing in NXT, where he was legitimately hurt, he was the champion, and that was it, you know? They revolved this entire comeback of Aleister Black to this one angle. Who attacked Aleister Black? Who attacked Aleister Black? And they made it into a big storyline, you know? Interviewing everybody. Who did it? Did you see it? Blah, blah, blah. Nikki Cross was shown on top of a fucking rooftop, looking down. She was the last thing that we seen on that show. She was the one who says, Nikki knows, Nikki knows. And then when she whispered who it was in Aleister Black's ear, you see, WWE needs to go about this storyline like that. Like that! Now, it's a little obvious if it's Daniel Bryan. Career-altering announcement? Career-altering. Yeah, you tried to commit murder on Roman Reigns. But if WWE is smart... They'd go around asking people. They'd go around, you know, questioning people. They'd go around and have Roman Reigns kind of go through these situations where he's just very paranoid about what's happening next. It could be great creative storytelling. It could be great creative writing. It could be a way to get interest back in the show. If you build a murder mystery around who's trying to take out Roman Reigns and why they have Roman Reigns on their list as a number one target... That's going to get me to watch. That's going to get me to watch. And in the end of it all, when that match happens, I'm going to be that much more invested. You can't do this in six days. 
You can't do it on SmackDown Live. You can't do it on the next pay-per-view. You have to do it and build it up as being something important. Why don't you take this storyline and build it towards that one show on Fox on October 5th? Have it culminate there. Daniel Bryan comes out the week before and he attacks Roman Reigns and they book the match on that Friday. That's a big-time match. You're going to need a big-time match because AEW ain't fucking around. You're going to need a big-time match. I'd love to see what this could do. I'd love to see what this could do for television. I'd love to see what they could do when they really dive into the storytelling and give it time. Now, I know I'm speaking to the fucking wall and none of that's going to happen because that's too much of a, of a distance between now and, and WWE trying to tell a story. WWE has no patience. They want to take something and blow it off in a fucking day. In a week. That's teetering on the, oh, it's too long for long-term storytelling because WWE doesn't believe in that. But they need to. They need to because their competition is going to be doing that. And when people are more invested in that than they are in WWE, they'll go back to wanting to do that all over again. Roman Reigns and the Mystery Attacker more than likely will be Daniel Bryan, but they have to do something which gets the people interested and not blow it off because if they do it at SummerSlam, it's not going to mean anything. I don't want to see this match happen four times in one fucking month. That's not the way you do things. WWE released a statement that they have opened an internal investigation on the matter. It's nice that they let fans know about this, but a preliminary investigation has found the incident Tuesday night involving Roman Reigns was caused by a forklift backstage carrying lights and lighting grids that were not properly secured. So it was all to blame on a forklift not being secured. Who the fuck was driving the forklift? Why was the forklift in motion? You know? Why were there cameras on the scaffolding on the boxes that fell over? There was boxes. There was cameras on the scaffolding that fell down. Was that a normal place for a security camera? I don't know. So we'll see what happens. But WWE, apparently, they're booking a forklift versus Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. You know, the last time we seen Daniel Bryan on a forklift was, I believe, in a casket match with Kane. I don't know why I thought of that. I, I know when Daniel Bryan, when Daniel Bryan won the WWE Championship, I, I believe his first opponent was Kane at the following pay-per-view, and he was standing on top of a forklift. He jumped off the forklift into the ring on top of Kane. I could be wrong. Is it, is it that? What, what was that, Extreme Rules? I don't know why I thought of that, but WWE has to go about this doing it right because if they don't, they're going to fuck up what could be really, really special. And I don't want to see them do that. Even if Roman Reigns is involved here, man, this is a big deal. This is a big money match. A match that you could definitely revisit down the line when the stakes are even higher. So don't blow all your eggs on this one fucking situation. Don't give me the match four times in one month. Be careful with it. Tease me. I want to be invested. And that's a lot coming from me, being that Roman Reigns is involved in this thing. I want to be invested, because I care that much about Daniel Bryan. Guys, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Sponsored by today, right here on Off The Script, Ridge. Ridge.com slash script. Use code script at checkout for 10% off. I got to tell you guys this one story, man. I was in Atlantic City, and I was on the Atlantic City boardwalk at the Beer Garden, Right outside Tropicana. Sat down, I wanted a nice cold beverage and a Bavarian pretzel with homemade beer cheese and homemade spicy mustard. Sounds pretty damn good, I know. I looked over to my left and these two guys sat down next to me. I did not engage in conversation. But I looked over as they ordered their beer and the man pulled out not a wallet but he had his credit card and his ID together with a paperclip. A paperclip, folks. He didn't even have a wallet. Now, meanwhile, me, I'm sitting down having my ice-cold beverage and my Bavarian pretzel with beer cheese and spicy mustard, and I have all my IDs and credit cards in my Ridge wallet. Not only did I look at him like he was crazy, but I looked at him and wondered why he didn't have a Ridge wallet. That's unsafe. And it's pretty unattractive, if you ask me. Now, the Ridge makes everyday goods to a standard you don't see every day. They help you streamline your life by turning things around that you carry, like backpacks, chargers, wallets, 
into tools for better living. Their flagship product, the Ridge Wallet, was launched on Kickstarter in 2013 and now sits in the front pockets of over a half a million men and women, including myself. The Ridge is a minimal front pocket wallet that's designed to streamline what you carry every single day. And folks, it is so great. It's got over 30,000 five-star reviews, and it is a better way to carry your cash and your cards. There's a lifetime warranty if you love it and free returns if you do not. And I'm guaranteeing you right now that you will. It comes in titanium. I have the Sunburst titanium. Carbon fiber, aluminum, and over a dozen different styles and colors. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping by going to ridge.com slash script. Folks, that's ridge.com slash script. Use code script in the description and make sure you guys tell me about your story when you get your very own Ridge wallet. Ridge.com slash script. You know, I watched SmackDown Live on Tuesday and I was very upset at some of the creative booking decisions on that show. I don't even know where to begin with this, folks. I, 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 I want to burst into anger, but I know it's not going to be good for me. I really know it's not going to be good for me. I don't want to come off as a screaming lunatic, but this is not how you operate a business, folks. Vince McMahon clearly went dumb. I praised SmackDown Live the week before. I thought it was a very good show. A lot of good that happened on that show. A lot of... Logic, they went back into the time machine and used old storylines to tell new storylines with those existing characters. SmackDown Live even had a great match this week with Kevin Owens and Drew McIntyre. Great match. But the one thing that stood out to me was the Ember Moon Bailey versus Nicole Cross because Nikki, I don't know who the fuck Nikki is. It's not the Nikki from NXT that I know. Nicole Cross and Alexa Bliss. This is the one thing that I focused most of my attention on. And the one thing that made me say, Ah, uh, what? Why? How? Please elaborate. Ember Moon was called up to the main roster from NXT and was given nothing to do. Absolutely nothing to do. This woman has been sitting in catering. This woman has been sitting in obscurity for the better part of a year and a half. Don't even know why they called her up. Vince McMahon, reportedly, is not a fan of Ember Moon. And I went over this already. I I'm going to reiterate it again. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Ember Moon is not a blonde bimbo. That's what that basically means. Ember Moon is not a part of the blonde brigade. If she was, then she would be 17-time world champion. Now, Ember Moon was put in this title match because there legitimately is nobody else. I was excited about it because if you give those two women, Bailey and Ember Moon, enough time on SummerSlam's night, on August 11th, they could potentially steal the show. But then I watched SmackDown Live on Tuesday, and it's more than obvious that Ember Moon is just there because we have nobody else. Ember Moon is there simply to fill a void that WWE had no other choice but to fill with Ember Moon. Ember Moon, if you wanted her to be in a title match, her credibility should have been at a level in which I could look at Ember Moon on TV and say, yep, she's a contender. She deserves it. We're merely saying the same thing about Ember Moon right now, folks, because we want Ember Moon to succeed. You see, when you give someone credibility, you know that they deserve that shot. Ember Moon deserves an opportunity to show us that she deserves that shot. Ember Moon doesn't necessarily deserve a shot at the SmackDown Live Women's Championship. The only reason why we are saying that she does is because we want her to get an opportunity so badly. But I have to ask, what has Ember Moon done to show you that she's a credible champion? Or a credible contender to the championship? Nothing. That's not her fault. That's because she's not a part of the Blonde Brigade. She's not Alexa. She's not Carmella. She's not Charlotte. She's not Lacey. She's not none of them. She's not none of them. 
More importantly, she's not Alexa. Ember Moon should be a credible threat to the SmackDown Live Women's title and Bayley in the overall grand scheme of things in the SmackDown Live Women's division. She's not. Asuka, if you really want to go back into the time machine, had one of the best women's matches that this company has ever produced against Asuka. Remember her? I certainly don't. I can't tell who the fuck Asuka is anymore because if you go to her social media, she's playing video games while SmackDown Live is airing on the USA Network. Awesome. Awesome. Ember Moon deserves an opportunity to get back to that spot. Vince McMahon's not a fan for whatever reason. Brad Shepard reported he can't go into the reason why. I just gave you the reason why. That reason was exactly what I mentioned, and that reason became apparent on Tuesday night. Ember Moon took a twisted bliss and took a pinfall loss in a tag team title match against Alexa Bliss and Nicole Cross. Dave Meltzer was on Wrestling Observer Radio and stated that WWE's reasoning for this is this, and I quote, There were three Raw acts on SmackDown Live. There was Alexa Bliss and Nicole Cross. There was Drew McIntyre and Kevin Owens. And there was AJ Styles and Kofi Kingston. They were going to beat Drew. And they were going to beat AJ, which even that I didn't understand. So they felt like they had to have Raw win one. End quote. So, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. You're telling me that Raw needed a win on SmackDown Live in the middle of a SummerSlam build right now that you're three weeks in. All you have is three weeks. SummerSlam's build is three weeks because you had a minus one because of the Raw reunion garbage. Two weeks away from SummerSlam, and you're pinning your challenger for the SmackDown Live Women's Championship. What does that tell you about WWE and how they value, A, the SmackDown Live Women's title, B, the SmackDown Live Women's division, C, women's wrestling in general, D, Bayley, E, Ember Moon? They needed Raw to win one. I don't see why making Raw look good means anything to any show at all in this particular portion of the year. Monday Night Raw makes themselves look bad every single fucking week. Raw superstars don't need to come to SmackDown Live to look bad. Especially not by sacrificing storytelling and logic and making your fucking performers look credible going into a championship match. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? Are you out of your fucking mind? Because Raw had to win one. And I don't know what it is with Alexa Bliss, man. It's Becky, then Bailey. Becky, then Bailey. Becky, then Bailey. The woman is like a fucking parasite for the women's championship on either fucking show. Alexa Bliss belongs nowhere near. A championship or a championship contender. She shouldn't even be on my fucking television. The only thing that Alexa Bliss should be doing is asking me if I want cream or regular 2% milk. You want sugar or sweet and low? That's all she should be asking me. I'll take sugar in the raw, please, honey. Light and sweet. Fucking ridiculous with this shit. What the fuck does that woman have to do with anything on these shows? You're bl- I don't know how anybody can't see it. Swear to God. This woman could go sell fucking bath water and all the fucking cretins on social media would make it the biggest thing that the world has ever seen. WWE can legitimately fucking bottle Alexa Bliss bath water and it would be the number one selling item on WWEshop.com. Don't even fucking tell me. I already know. And people legitimately, these super fans would fucking drink it, they'd sleep with it, they'd fucking lick it, they'd fucking baptize themselves in it, they'd fucking light it and fucking create incense next to their fucking bed tables while they're looking at posters of Alexa Bliss and fucking jerking the chicken. I know! It's pathetic. It's absolutely fucking pathetic. Alexa Bliss pins Ember Moon. 
Because Raw needed to win one. First of all, Alexa Bliss is a Raw superstar on SmackDown Live. Why? If there's any reason, nothing about the wild card rule is mentioned. They, they, they don't even mention the wild card rule anymore. So Alexa Bliss is just a Raw superstar there for no reason. You didn't give me a reason as to why she's there. You didn't give me a reason as to why she's there. So that's number one. That's your first offense. Number two, why are you pairing Ember Moon and Bailey in a generic tag team match? Oh, here we go. The champion and the challenger are teaming up. Let me go back and tell the generic storytelling of the champion and the challenger needing to be a cohesive unit to fucking succeed. Then they get to the title match. Like, that has any fucking meaning for what they're going to do at SummerSlam. Why? Because they're two baby faces? You couldn't think of anything better? How about this? How about not making the match altogether? So we're spared from this fucking bullshit. You didn't want Raw to lose one. How about not booking the match at all? Or better yet, how about booking Bailey and Ember Moon if you want the, if you wanted them to team up? How about booking them against another SmackDown team like Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? But no, you had to get Alexa Bliss mixed in with Bailey again because she's women's champion. Oh, by the way, what happened to Ember Moon? Or not Ember Moon? What happened to Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose? I thought they had a Non-title match against the Iconics. Ah, oh, you must have forgot about that because they mentioned it last week. Right? Couldn't change the plans. You couldn't do that match. You couldn't do Ember Moon and Bailey versus Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose. It had to be Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross so that you can give me this fucking half-assed excuse because Raw can't lose one. Folks, this company is a complete fucking joke. WWE is a complete fucking joke in every sense of the word. Dave Meltzer continues, because it's not over. Another reason is that Alexa Bliss and Nicole Cross are going to be in the women's tag team title match. So that's the other reason. Oh. So let me try and grab the fucking balls of this bull here. So, the women's tag team titles are now more important then the SmackDown Live Women's Championship, because Alexa Bliss and Nicole Cross beat Bayley and Ember Moon, which I'm guessing gives them a tag team title opportunity, but Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville were supposed to get one. The Kabuki Warriors were also in line to get one, so they jumped the line on two other teams. Is that what you're telling me? Is that what you're telling me? By this win... This is what you needed to do to get Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross in the fucking tag team title match that you got going on at SummerSlam. You jeopardized momentum for Ember Moon to get Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross in the tag team title match while shitting on the SmackDown Live Women's Championship match. A match that is clearly more important in comparison to the women's tag team titles. Titles that have not been defended on fucking TV since they won them. And on an act that right now should be fucking let go and released, being how fucking terrible they are. Because they make every segment and every show that much more worse when they're on it. Vince needs to go. The wild, if this doesn't tell you, the wild card rule needs to go, man. Separate rosters is the way to be. I'll take separate rosters for 500, Alex. Fuck yes! Vince McMahon, I swear to fucking God, I wish he would lose his fucking vision so he couldn't look at Alexa Bliss's nice, perky ass anymore because that's the only reason why she's getting TV time and championship match after championship match after championship match. Jesus fucking Christ, man. So WWE is setting up a fatal four-way match because clearly there are other teams that are in line for the tag team titles or at least promised opportunities at the tag team titles. It's going to be Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, the Kabuki Warriors, Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, and the Idiotics in a fatal four-way for the women's tag team titles. I'll give you one guess as to who's going to win. Let's take a guess. Mandy Rose is blonde. She's a beautiful blonde. But Sonya Deville is not looked at as a blonde. She may be mingling with the blonde, but Mandy Rose only keeps her around because she looks better by association. Does Sonya Deville. Not going to happen. Not going to happen whatsoever. If that was the case, they would have put them on Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville already. Clearly, Mandy Rose was being set up for a push. That was clearly killed, and WWE is not going to revisit that anytime soon. The Kabuki Warriors. Do I even need to go into the reason why the Kabuki Warriors are not going to win? They don't speak English. Their eyes are slanted. There you go. 
You wanted my honest answer? There you go. They're Japanese. They're not American. They're not blonde. Simple as that. Now we got the Iconics. Peyton Royce is blonde. Peyton Royce is now a blonde, right? There you go. But they're terrible. The titles have been on them and wasting away on them. So Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross are been or have been the main act that they've pushed that have been together and how now we look at them as a legit pairing. WWE has kept them together so long that we now look at them as a legit pairing. So I would not be surprised if Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross are going to win the women's tag team titles. And let me tell you something, folks. In my, in my time doing this, I've always been honest with you. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross holding the tag team championships is going to be just as bad, if not worse, than the Iconics holding the tag team championships. It means nothing. It means nothing. This is merely going to be done because the titles are fucking dead and buried already. They are completely worthless. And this is another way for WWE to pad the resume of Alexa Bliss by basically doing nothing and having her go through nothing to even get the opportunity. The fucking political agenda and the favoritism in this company is eye-rolling. It's one of which it, it makes everyone watching it fucking sick to their stomach. The tag team titles of the women's division should be fucking burned, and I would fucking sit there and sip my beverage and laugh while the fucking ashes go up in the air. I would, You couldn't pay me to piss on that fucking fire to put it out. That's what the titles need to be. Dead, buried, and burned with nothing more than fucking ashes as the remains. Fucking awful. You killed it. Something so promising and you fucking killed it. Every single week that the Iconics held those titles and were off TV or battled enhancement talent by making their fucking stupid pose, whatever the fuck they do, you killed every ounce of credibility to a point where it, it cannot be saved. It cannot be saved. You might as well dig the fucking hole in the ground right now and throw them right in there and create a fucking tombstone. They didn't last six months. And that's a fucking sad thing to know, knowing that they came from a good place and WWE legitimately had no desire to do anything with them. Now, speaking of Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, the Iconics were supposed to wrestle Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville on SmackDown Live. The setup for this match was so popular in the IWC that it even made headlines due to the way Mandy Rose and Sonya botched the segment last week by announcing the match was going to be a title match. And then they said, when we win this match, then we'll be in line for a tag team title match. Meanwhile, she just said moments ago that they got a title match. And then she says, well, when, when, when we win it, we're going to get a tag team title match. Now, apparently... WWE had this thing where Billy Kay had puppy fever. I'm guessing she adopted a puppy or got a new puppy, so the match had to be canceled. This seems like a strange excuse. Doesn't seem strange to me. WWE will find a way for Billy Kay and Peyton Royce to not wrestle at all. And when they do, it's a fucking comedy act, folks. Grab the popcorn, extra butter, a little bit of salt, and grab a cold beverage, man. You're going to be in for a long evening. Laugh your ass off comedy when the Iconics are in the ring. Puppy fever. There you go. Ridiculous. I couldn't give two fucking shits about anything in the women's division, let alone the tag team division of WWE. Switch gears here, man. Let's go to talk. Let's go and talk about AEW. Got some AEW news here. Oh, AEW. JD's an AEW cocksucker. JD is an AEW cocksucker. Sure he is. Sure he is. That's why Chris Van Vliet got hired by AEW, right? You fucking saying the same thing about him? Clowns. I'll be there. Don't worry. How many tickets did AEW sell for the debut on TNT? Well, we mentioned 14,000. Done. Sold out. Washington, D.C. Going to be a nice little destination for AEW. Now, the one thing is, why did AEW choose Washington, D.C. for the first city to debut on TNT? Cody said this in an interview with Chad Dukes on 106.7 The Fan. Rhodes explains why Washington, D.C. was chosen to host the premiere episode of AEW on TNT. This is what he had to say, and I quote, We had a really strong presence in terms of, you know, what we're able to do with this, and we're, we're able to track a lot of data. And I know that might sound like, whoa, that's the nerdiest answer ever. But you're able to track a lot of the data and see where, okay, where we did the most views coming from Bleacher Report Live and things of that nature. 
And when I say we've got those artists who are running this and these inmates who are running the asylum, one of the best things that we've done, myself, Matt, Nick, and Kenny, as EVPs with AEW, one of the best things we've done is said, okay, we don't know how to do this, let's hire somebody who does. I'll give you an example. Raphael Murphy, who came from WWE and was there with me as our market representative. That's the individual who can look all across the board and who can strategically place us in the best market and service every market that we possibly can and reflect that data that's been reflected and appease that. And all that math and all that science. We built a really great team around us and the short answer is I am a big fan of American history. I am the American freaking nightmare. It makes perfect sense that we're in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. So the short answer, the long answer, or that's the short answer. The long answer is that we've got a lot of wonderful professional people who said this is the spot you want to be for the first show. End quote. Doesn't matter where they are, folks. They just sold 14,000 tickets to their debut episode, which is an instant sellout in two hours. Good on them. I'll be watching it. AEW Weekly right here on Off the Script. And I will be watching AEW over NXT on a weekly basis, and I will give you guys the details on what I'm thinking about as far as scheduling going forward into the fall. Speaking of which, debut on TNT, going to be a big night, folks. A big night. AEW not only announced that big six-man tag, not only did they announce Cody versus Sammy Guevara, but they're announcing to crown a new women's champion on that very first night. Sports Illustrated reports that All Elite Wrestling will crown their first ever AEW Women's Champion during the TNT debut episode. The type of match or competitors involved were not noted, but Brandi Rhodes said AEW wants to treat their Women's Champion with respect and hold the title to a very high standard. Unlike WWE, where they don't hold anything women do in high regard or high standard. The only thing that they hold in high regard is how tight Alexa Bliss can wear those black leather pants on a moment of bliss. I said it, I said it. Blow me. You know it's true. Brandy says this, and I quote, For many female wrestlers, the opportunity to fight for the title represents the crowning achievement of their career. The AEW Women's Championship will be the cornerstone of the women's division. The championship will be treated with the utmost respect and prestige. We hope to inspire future female superstars to dream of holding such a meaningful title. End quote. I love this. Now, I don't know who's going to be a part of it, but Bea Priestley is already tweeting out that she's going to win it. Britt Baker is obviously going to be the face of that women's division. We got Nyla Rose. We got Awesome Kong. We got Kylie Ray. Got some good women there, man. We got some good women there. Plus, some that we don't even know of and haven't made TV yet or any of their shows yet. What I would do is I would take the six best and do a gauntlet match. Now, I know, I know, we're sick of the gauntlet matches. That's because WWE made you sick of the gauntlet matches. That's why WWE is in this thing and they don't know what to fucking do. They did the gauntlet match on Monday because it got them to a point where they could go to commercial in every intermission during that pinfall. So there's five guys, so that means they took four commercials. That's why they do these things. The gauntlet match with Kofi. Kofi had to go through two. Then the New Day had to go through a gauntlet match to get Kofi into WrestleMania. We're, we're gauntlet matched out. Fucking due to exhaustion. But I would really do. I would take the five best, and I would have a gauntlet match, and I would have them randomly chosen. And the title, the last two women in the ring, that would be for the women's championship at the end of the night. I don't want to see a battle royal. I don't think they have enough women to do a tournament because they're already doing a tournament for the tag team titles. I think that would be great. I think that would be awesome. So, more information on that. Brandy said that the title will be unveiled at All Out. So, in Chicago, they're unveiling the new title. And we are going to get information on who's going to be in this thing and what type of match it's going to be on the road to All Out on the on the YouTube channel, on the All Elite Wrestling YouTube channel and on the Nightmare Family YouTube channel, which is phenomenal, by the way. The way that they shoot these things, it's absolutely r ridiculous, man. It's so good. It's crisp. It's clean. It's fresh. It's, it's just got a realistic vibe to it. And the funny thing is WWE is going to be using new cameras, these really high-end, high-tech cameras for SmackDown Live on Fox, because AEW really has that down to a fucking science, man. That production value with these YouTube videos, that's, the, that's what you're going to see on TNT. And we've seen some of that on the shows. We've seen some of that at Double or Nothing. So, AEW stepping up their game, man. And WWE, 
as always, following behind and following the leader. Now they got to get up to where AEW is in terms of, you know, camera and how to present itself because AEW is going to do one be is they're going to be doing one thing and you know WWE is going to be looking at, "Ooh, what are they doing? What are they doing? What type of technology they got over there? Why they look better than us?" And then then they're going to incorporate that into SmackDown Live. That's the way it's going to be. I'm not surprised by that whatsoever. I'm excited about this women's division. I'm excited more so for the tag team division, but it's going to be interesting to see what AEW does with the women's championship. Cody Rhodes did make a statement about Vince McMahon's blood and guts comment. He simply said this. You guys can watch this on the Nightmare Family on the last episode to the Road to All Out. While hyping the ticket sales for All Elite Wrestling's TNT October 2nd debut show, Cody Rhodes addressed Vince McMahon's comments from last week and the investor conference call where he referred to AEW as blood and guts. McMahon referred to WWE as the sophisticated wrestling program. No, I I, I look at WWE as more as a uh, shitty comedy act, one in which I'm sitting down and I don't find anything you're doing entertaining. Now, Rhodes gave his response to the blood and guts comments, and he embraced the blood and guts and the passion that goes into pro wrestling. That's pretty much what he said. Yes, you're damn right we're blood and guts because of the passion and the blood and the guts that have gone into making this business how great it is right now. And I like that answer. I really do. Cody obviously was going to say something about that. You know every shot that WWE takes on them, they are going to, more than, more specifically Cody, Cody is going to say something. Matt, Nick, and Kenny, they don't, they don't do that type of thing. It's not in their nature to do that type of thing. Kenny tried to do it with the Evolve thing, but... You know, he, he immediately deleted that comment on social media. But Cody's usually the one that's going to be in the front of the line, you know, firing those shots. So, I, I agree with him, man. Just like I agreed with him yesterday when we talked about how he doesn't want to cater to the casuals on TNT, which is great. You shouldn't be catering to the casuals because catering to the casuals is what Monday Night Raw does on Monday. Catering to the casuals is the reason why WWE is in the position that they're in right now. Cody wants to take care of the fan base that got him here and got AEW to sell out 14,000 fucking tickets. So, whatever you're doing is going to easily, easily going to catch the interest of the casual. Because they have no choice. They're going to have no choice at the end of it. Because this is the way pro wrestling is going to be moving forward into 2020. I love it. There's no reason why you should not be standing with Cody Rhodes on that instance. Going back to the WWE, man. Everybody talks about the cover of 2020, WWE 2K20, right? I don't give a shit who's on the cover. You could put fucking, you could put anybody on the cover of WWE 2K games. I don't give a shit. Why do I care who's on the cover? It's not who's on the cover. It's who's fucking making the game and making it the best that it could possibly be. It's what's on the disc when I buy it. And put it into my fucking PlayStation. I don't care. Now, I have a a, a logical guess as to who's going to be on the cover. Becky Lynch was the biggest thing in WWE for the majority of the year going into WrestleMania. And still is. She still is. She's probably going to be on the cover of WWE 2K20. Now, Becky Lynch was recently interviewed by Vince Beltran of Vibe and Wrestling. Never heard of it before in my entire life. I don't know. This is where she talked about the next step in her career with WWE. What does Becky Lynch want to do next? Lynch stated that being the man is synonymous with accomplishing a first several times. She knows this better than anyone as she's part of the first women's match to headline WrestleMania. Women main eventing SmackDown Live, women's ladder match, women's Royal Rumble match, SmackDown Live women's champion, Raw women's champion, first ever Raw and SmackDown women's champion. Then Lynch stated that being on the cover of WWE 2K20 would be the next step. She says this, and I quote, it's all about being the first, so being the first woman on the cover of 2K20 would be awesome. End quote. Now, they're going to announce this August 5th. Pro Wrestling Sheet put out a tweet this morning, actually, saying that they're hearing multiple sources say that Becky Lynch is not going to be the only one on the 2K20 cover. It's going to be a little different this year. They're, they're going to do one cover, but they're also going to do like a special cover. Becky might be on the actual cover, but they might do a collection of women. You might see Becky, Ronda, and Charlotte on the cover of the game. So I could see that happening as well. WWE, I think for 2K14, did 
four different covers. I think it was Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock. I think it was like Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan, if I'm not mistaken, or John Cena, one of them. They had four different covers. So you can make it however you want, but I think this year it's going to be Becky Lynch, and I think it's going to be a mixture of women with Becky, like Charlotte, Ronda, God forbid Alexa, but it might be the entire division. You might get one big, you know, cover with all the women on the roster, highlighting the women's evolution, you know. Sasha Banks was reported to be working with WWE 2K Games and filming some stuff. She might have filmed something to be on the cover of the game. I don't know. This could be what she filmed. I have no idea. So, Becky Lynch is more than likely going to be on the cover of 2K20, but it's not about that. The, the one thing, and I can speak here because this is my podcast and I can say whatever the hell I want. The marketing behind 2K and from 2K Games is horrendous. It is really garbage. You know, every single year they're getting worse and worse and worse about how they unveil their game. I don't give a shit. And I, I think the majority of us feel the same way, but some people in the community are afraid to say so because if they do, then they're not going to get invited down to the PC or, or to the fucking playtest of the game. The way they go about it every year is fucking garbage. I don't give a shit who's on the cover. I don't give a shit who the roster is. I don't give a shit about your lame-ass reveals, revealing legends here and legends there. I don't give a shit about the roster. Watch the shows. You know who's going to be in the game. If they're not in the game, more than likely someone in the community is going to create somebody in the fucking workshop that looks better than whatever model 2K can come up with anyway. Okay? Enough is enough with the bullshit about how these games are unveiled. In my eyes, 2K Games and whoever's associated with this shit needs to relinquish the fucking license and give it to somebody that actually gives a shit. Seriously. There's no reason why Fire Pro Wrestling World has a GM mode and we don't have a GM mode all these years in 2K Games. There's no reason why I can't create my own storylines. There's no reason why I can't put my own fucking theme music so I don't have to use the fucking theme music from WWE Music. Because every time I do and I want to upload something, I have to mute it. I have to mute it. Because they're fucking greedy and they want all the revenue. And then I gotta have my shit look garbage. I have to have my video look like shit because I have to lower all the music. And how great does it look when someone is fucking playing the game and they have a wrestler coming out with no fucking theme music? Give me a break. I want my own storyline. What happened to the storyline creator? What? What happened to the fucking scenes that you could pick from? The fucking painful and tedious task of trying to piece together some creative storylines for your subscribers by playing the game. It takes you about six hours to fucking sift through all the scenes on that motherfucker. And then at the end of the day, there's no sound, there's nothing in those scenes. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I don't know what else I could say. Seriously. What are you going to give me? How are you going to enhance career mode after you did it last year? How many career modes could we see? How many Chris Dangers could we see? You need to tell me the fucking same guy is going through NXT up to the main roster over and over and over and over and over again. Same thing with Mr. 9 to 5. My God. How many times has he got to go through NXT? Now he's wrestling in Mexico. Now he's wrestling in Guatemala. Who the fuck cares? Who cares? Now he's dressing up as Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior to get Triple H's attention. It's to a point where there's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to do. All we want is a fucking interactive game where I could stream it and create my own shit. I want to be the Vince McMahon of 2K. That's what I want. I want to separate the rosters via a draft. I want to have legitimate draft in the game. I want to have a universe mode that makes me the fucking GM where I could watch the match and do commentary and have fun with my people on Twitch or wherever I'm streaming. And I want the fucking shit to be just worthy of playing more than three months. After career mode, I was done. Done. I tried to pick up the game and I felt like I was picking up a fucking game that was seven years old. It was just so boring. Absolutely boring. How you guys play it. Some of you guys I know personally play this shit every single day. Content going up every single day. I don't want to hear about the news. I don't want to hear about the rumors. 
Give me a fucking game that's going to last 12 months. And if you have no more heart and passion to deliver a good wrestling game like we felt when No Mercy was out, nothing has even come close to No Mercy. If you don't have the heart to make a good game and you're resting on your fucking laurels and you're just doing whatever the fuck you want to make a quick, easy buck by taking the same fucking engine and the same gameplay and re recycling it every single year, that's just garbage. The first thing that they did, oh, look at Brock Lesnar, the way he looks this year. The new screenshot that they posted up. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, we don't know what the fuck Brock Lesnar looks like. I don't give a shit what they look like. They could look like fucking 8-bit fucking motherfuckers. Just give me a playable game that isn't shit after three months. I'm getting the fuck out of here, man. Seriously. There was another story here about Becky Lynch believing WWE can hold another Evolution pay-per-view without Ronda Rousey. Of course they can. Will they? Of course not. They can't and will not do anything without a major name because they don't believe in their women's division. They do not believe in their women's division. Becky Lynch recently spoke with Alex McCarthy of Talk Sport, and she said this. Oh, absolutely. First and foremost, it was one of the best pay-per-views of the year. And that's not be that's not me being biased. That's a fact. It had match of the year on it, including yours truly. She ain't wrong about that. It's one of the best matches of the whole fucking year. Absolutely. I don't see any reason why not. I think we have a strong enough women's division without Rousey as long as they tell the stories around us and let us go. And that's all I will say. Good luck. WWE doesn't believe in any of the women that they have on their roster because the women on their roster don't have a household name. They are merely eye candy. That's why you get the eye candy being pushed and the actual legitimate pro wrestlers are pushed to the side because that doesn't fly well with whomever in the WWE. Of course they can have an evolution without Ronda Rousey. We didn't need Ron we didn't need Ronda Rousey at last year's evolution. The overall show would have been better without Rousey and Nikki Bella in the main event. You fucking kidding me? Getting WWE to do another evolution is like asking for a magic genie to grant you to be, I would say, more rich than Jeff Bezos. Of Amazon. Not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Asking WWE to push their women's division is hard enough. Giving us another evolution without Ronda Rousey on it? That's not gonna happen ever. As long as Ronda Rousey's employed with the WWE. How about we get the women's divisions to where they should be? Like, after Evolution happened last year when the women's division was riding high on both Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair with Oscar thrown in. Let's get everybody on the same fucking page before we start talking about an evolution. And the only reason why evolution will happen anyway the next time is because WWE has an easy out. They can't have women wrestle in Saudi Arabia. So if evolution happens, it's going to be more of, oh, we're, we're sorry, here you go. Instead of them wanting to genuinely do it and continue to build women's wrestling. It's not going to happen. Becky Lynch wants it to happen, but that doesn't mean we're going to see it in WWE. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much for all your support. If you enjoyed the podcast, let me know down below. Hit that thumbs up. Vote in the poll. If I remember to put it in, vote in the poll. I would love to know your thoughts on the question that I asked earlier. Make sure you guys also check out there the videos that you might have missed this weekend already and earlier in the week. Everything you need is linked right there. Make sure you guys follow me on social media. Hit that subscribe button down below. And if you guys want to check out Harry's, I would really, really appreciate it. Harry's.com slash script for your free trial. And you're going to get everything included there for a perfectly close, comfortable, smooth shave, man. Harry's.com slash script. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much. And I will see you right back here on Sunday. Don't know what we're going to talk about, but I got a major story about WWE wanting Seth Rollins to feel cool again. Maybe you shouldn't have put him in a fucking TMZ-like program with his girlfriend, Becky Lynch. That's a start. We're going to go all the way back to last year when Rollins was the best thing on WWE, and then they did it for Roman. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Thank you guys so much. Hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you right back here on part three for Off the Script.